Hi, I'm Larry Reed, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm Doug Stewart, your host, and we are going to continue sharing with you a webinar series that we did back in early 2018 that was taught by a variety of teachers. What we wanted to do is give people a live interactive event where they could be taught some things that are at the intersection of faith and freedom and interact with the teacher there. And so today's episode is going to be from Jason Huey. It's going to be, What Does the Bible Say About Government? And of course, he's going to talk about Romans 13, which is obviously a perennial question uh, for Christian libertarians. And, And I'll be honest, when I first heard kind of ways in which we can interpret Romans 13 that comport more with the whole message of scripture rather than just like, oh, you should obey the government, uh, it took a while. And so if if you think that, you're like, oh, I'm sick of hearing about Romans 13, there's always something new to be gained by uh, great libertarian thinkers when it comes to, you know, interpreting Romans 13. So I will uh, let you audio files know that the audio isn't quite up to our normal expectations for episodes, but it was it was a live webinar, and so it kind of matched the acceptability of those kind of standards. So uh, while I want the audio to appear better, uh, our audio guy does a great job cleaning things up, but it just wasn't as optimal as we as we would typically expect. So just wanted to give you a heads up. It's definitely worth paying attention to in terms of content, but I hope you'll forgive us for the slightly less quality audio. So here is Jason Huey talking about the Bible and government. So let me introduce Jason. So Jason Huey is a personal trainer and a group fitness instructor. He earned his BA in government from Regent University, and he has worked for several liberty advancing nonprofits before switching to the fitness industry full time. And he is also co-author of the book called The Freedom. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. I've said this several times on the podcast. I delayed reading this book because I thought I knew everything that was in it and it was way better than I expected when I actually read it. I was like, oh my goodness, this I should have read this months ago. So you should have read this months ago. Go out and buy it. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Doug. Really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk with uh, you all at the Libertarian Christian Institute about uh, what the Bible says about government. Uh, and I just want to I just want to begin by telling you guys a little bit more about who I am and kind of and my story in how I've come to uh, research and ultimately write a chapter on this in, in the book that Doug talked about called The Freedom. Uh, I, I used to work, as, as Doug mentioned, for several liberty advancing nonprofits in Washington, D.C., or the D.C. area uh, in Alexandria. Uh, I lived in Alexandria, worked in Arlington, so inside the Beltway. And I, it, I obviously had a, a really passion for advancing the ideas of a free society. But also as a Christian, I interacted with a lot of people who were not Christians, who were also libertarians, or I interacted with a lot of Christians who were not libertarians. And I realized that a lot of Christians who weren't libertarians didn't think that Christianity and libertarianism were compatible. And I realized that a lot of libertarians who weren't Christians didn't think that Christians could be rationally libertarian. It just didn't make sense, even within the liberty movement. Now, there were, of course, many people also who weren't. Christians who thought they were compatible, but there was still a good number on both sides of the aisle that that didn't think that you were compatible. So in the midst of all this, myself and my wife and and several other young professionals in that, in those organizations got together and we decided to to have a little book club where we just read various works of political thought and and, theology. And we talked a lot about, are these ideas compatible and how they were compatible? And that led to called the freedom actually out of that little book group that we formed uh, a long time ago in a little coffee shop in Arlington, Virginia, uh, that spawned the idea that, Hey, we can write a book about this to talk a little bit about our stories and how we believe these ideas of libertarianism and Christianity can indeed uh, very much coincide. And I was assigned the task of talking about what does the Bible say about government, uh, which was 
a daunting task, to say the least. Uh, I, I did research in, in, in college, went for my undergraduate degree on uh, the political philosophy of St. Augustine and then various, of course, various other scholars and thinkers, Frederick Bastia as well. But I had never really done a really thorough examination of this is what the Bible says about government and how, how can we reconcile what the Bible says about government from a libertarian perspective uh, that is consistent with Christian theology. That isn't just trying to make it seem like, oh, we're holding these two ideas together, even though they don't quite fit. But we just believe that they work together, so we got to make them so. Um, I wanted to make sure that I was very respectful of Christian theology and of my prior faith commitments while still making a convincing argument that the two ideas could be held together. And that's, I wrote on the question of what does the Bible say about government? And ultimately, uh, I, I, it's been, a, it's been an interesting journey for me because I wasn't always a libertarian. I used to be, I grew up in a very conservative household. I used to think that uh, a lot of the things I thought growing up about what the Bible said about government, I've actually wrestled with and thought very deeply about uh, throughout this time and throughout this process. So at the end of this discussion, when we have the q and I'll be interested to, to hear your questions. Uh, but one thing that I really want to emphasize is this is not meant for me to say, I know all, I, this is the final answer. I know all the, all of the things that there is, that there are to say about this topic. But I think there might be some things I'm about to say that will challenge some preconceptions that we have about what the Bible says about government, or at least what we think the Bible says about government. And uh, hopefully my journey through the process of working in the D.C. Liberty Movement, working on the chapter called the Freedom and Freedom, and ultimately even leading to this conversation tonight, hopefully my journey is going to lead you guys to a sharper understanding of your perspective of our government, its role, uh, its legitimacy, and what the Bible has to say about it. So just a little bit about me there. Uh, let's talk now about why you guys are here and what you came to learn about. So what does the Bible say about government? Let's start with a few definitions, because I think it's very important to understand what we're talking about if we're trying to reconcile uh, different ideas together and to also understand specifically what we talk about when we refer to government. So first of all, I want to define Christianity as uh, a worldview that is based upon the centrality of Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Without that, the Christian worldview falls apart, uh, and it is a worldview. It's, it's all-encompassing. It's something that, uh, that governs uh, the way that we see and interact with the world around us. So I want to be very clear in saying that I define Christianity not as just um, – uh, uh, a faith, uh, a, a faith commitment, and a belief that something that we don't know and that we can't prove, because uh, I do believe that we can know and prove uh, many aspects of Christian faith. I believe it is a worldview that encompasses the way that we think, act, and interact with the world, and the ideas that are presented in it. And it is based upon the centrality of Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. It's told to us. Uh, we, we learn about it because of God's revelation in the Old and New Testaments. And uh, it tells us about the nature of God, the nature of man, God's plan for saving and redeeming all of his church. Libertarianism, I think, should be defined as the political philosophy that is based upon the principle of non-aggression. Now, I know that there's some libertarians that might not necessarily agree with that definition, but there's a lot of libertarians that do. It's, one, it's a definition that I go with. Uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, ascended to by uh, people like uh, Walter Block and Murray Rothbard and others. So I think there's some, uh, some good claps to that definition. Lastly, what do we mean when we talk about government? Because we're going to be talking about government a lot tonight. So what do we mean when we talk about government, especially what the Bible says about government? Uh, well, I believe that Max Weber and, and Hans Hermann Hoppe have done a good job of distinguishing the two characteristics that make government or the state uh, distinct from any other entity in society, and that is that uh, government is has the power of territorial monopoly over a uh, of lawmaking over a specific jurisdiction, and government also has the ability to tax uh, to force people to pay for the services it provides. And those two characteristics are distinct to states. A good example that I like to think about when I, I talk about this with people is. Imagine if a Domino's delivery man came to your door and he, he knocked on your door and said, hey, uh, I just brought you this pizza. You didn't order it, but I bought it to you. 
And you ask, oh, cool. Well, that sounds awesome. But then he says, yeah, you have to pay me $500 for this pizza. And you don't have a choice. You have to take the pizza. You have to pay me $500. Uh, and then you say, oh, what kind of toppings are on it? He it says, it's meat lovers. And then you say, well, I'm vegetarian. He says, it doesn't matter. $500, you have to pay me for the pizza. Uh, of course, we, we, that sounds absurd to us immediately uh, without even thinking about it. Uh, because that's never happened to us and it never will happen to us because Domino's doesn't have the power to tax. Um, although I would definitely not mind more pizza showing up at my door. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's important to note that, uh, that uh, government has that power. And that analogy that I gave of the Domino's Pizza Delivery Man is unfortunately not uh, unrepresentative of what actually happens when we think about the way government provides for and collects revenue for its services. So those are the two distinct characteristics of government or the state. So now, with those terms defined, we understand that we're talking about Christianity as a worldview. We understand we're talking about libertarianism as, as a specific political philosophy uh, based upon the principle of non-aggression. And we understand we're talking about government as a state, as, as an institution that has the power of territorial legal jurisdiction, uh, a monopoly on territorial legal jurisdiction, and the power of compulsory taxation. So what does the Bible in the Christian worldview, what does the Bible say about this institution? Is it legitimate? Is it, is it authoritative? Has God put it in place for our good? Uh, what, what does the Bible have to say about government? This question matters a lot. Uh, this question matters in an inordinate amount because God has revealed himself through the Bible. Scripture is authoritative. So if, if Scripture says something about a topic, we need to listen to what Scripture says. Uh, it's not uh, it's not something we can just disregard or or just eliminate from our thinking because we disagree with it. If we truly believe that God uh, reveals Himself through Scripture, it's His divine revelation of His nature, of His wisdom to us, of His plan for salvation. Then uh, we need to pay attention if it says something to us. And it's it's not something that just we can, as humans, uh, just refute and say is wrong simply because we want it to be wrong. It's, it's divine and authoritative over human knowledge. That being said, this is also a difficult question. This is one of the first things I wrestled with and called the freedom of writing the chapter. The Bible is not a work of political philosophy. So if I, if I were to read Plato, if I was to read The Republic by Plato, I would know going into the reading of Plato that I am trying to learn about something about political philosophy. I'm trying to learn about Plato's conception of political philosophy. I may be trying to study what and I, you know, I'm trying to agree or disagree with Plato on what an ideal regime might look like, uh, where uh, you know, Plato's thoughts about human nature in relationship to political society, all that kind of stuff. I know that going into a reading of the Republic. But if I pick up my Bible, I'm not picking up my Bible to read about how to structure a just society. I'm not reading my Bible to understand if, uh, if there should be a constitutional system with checks and balances or what a representative government should look like, that's, that's not what the Bible was written about. Uh, and so I think that's very important for us to remember is that it's, the Bible's authoritative, but there's this almost conundrum where the Bible's authoritative, but at the same time, it's not, it's not primarily written to tell us about how to structure our political society. And um, it, it really puts us almost in a tough position is why I wrestled so much at the beginning of writing called the, the chapter called the freedom is how do I try to understand what the Bible says about government when I know that the Bible is meant to have an even much higher purpose than to talk about political philosophy. I believe that the salvation of, of souls and the revealing of God's plan for the world is, is just is a far more superior, um, superior thing to consider compared to uh, the existence of temporal regimes. And, uh, and we need to understand that the Bible has a much higher purpose in mind uh, when, when it's speaking to us. But at the same time, can it still tell us something that, about government that helps us understand as libertarians why we are libertarian and, and justify our position as libertarians? Uh, or is it even contrary to us, our positions that are trans Obviously, I don't think it is, but you know, we have to consider that question to be intellectually honest. So given that issue, why even bother? Why even bother uh, with, with the Bible, um, with considering the Bible and, and what it has to do with, uh, 
with government or abuse of government. Um, I think the most important thing that we can take away is even though we know the Bible isn't a work of political philosophy, the Bible does teach us doctrines about human nature, about God's sovereignty, uh, about um, and about uh, ethics that can inform how we how we view government. And those are especially important for us to consider uh, when we're looking at the question, what does the Bible say about government? Uh, and so that's, and, and the other reason is because a lot of Christians do read the Bible as their political philosophy handbook. So I think we need to, I think we need to be able to, first of all, respond to those Christians and say, that might not be the way we should be reading the Bible in the first place. Uh, but uh, th- uh, also to, um, to understand how the Bible can still inform the way we think about political philosophy. All right, quickly, there's some things that we need to, before we dive in, and I'm about to dive in into the two most uh, controversial, I think the two most controversial passages in the Bible with regard to government, or at least the most widely held and widely referred to as uh, passages, and that is Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2. But before I dive into those, I want to say there's a few things that we absolutely can't compromise in this discussion. The first is that God is God and that there's no personal institution or any part of this creation that is superior to or deserves obedience or worship more than he does. Uh, and I don't think any Christian would disagree with that. Uh, scripture is authoritative. I've already talked about that. And we must not think of any other work uh, or any other uh, human the conception of human knowledge as being more authoritative than Scripture. Uh, so we have to assume that Scripture is authoritative in the context of this discussion, as, as in all discussions, uh, while also still remembering that Scripture is not necessarily speaking to us about political philosophy at all times. Uh, all humans are sinful and fall short of the glory of God. This is really important for us to remember. We're all sinful, whether we're political or non-political actors. Uh, and again, nothing that I think any Christian would disagree with with after a short reading of, of most of the book of Romans. As Christians, we are commanded to love our neighbor as we love ourselves as well. So this is, again, something else that I think we need to remember in the context of uh, what the Bible says about government. And lastly, uh, we need to avoid pretexting. So it's very easy when looking at this conversation, especially since the Bible isn't a work of political philosophy. So we go and find specific passages and verses that support our views, what we think the Bible says about government. And we just quote them uh, without thinking about the historical or scriptural context in which they were written. Uh, And I think that's super important for us not to do. So those are the things I think we need to remember to stay consistent with. Um, God is God. Scripture is authoritative. All humans are sinful, uh, and as Christians, we have to. We are commanded to love our neighbors. We love ourselves, and we should avoid pretext. And if we kind of stay consistent with kind of those rules, or remember all of that in the midst of this discussion, I think it'll help it be a lot more fruitful. Now, with that being said, here we go. We have Romans thirteen, which I do address a little bit in my chapter, but I'm going to talk about it in a little bit more detail, a little bit differently tonight than I do in my chapter called the Freedom. Uh, as well as First Peter 2. I'm going to read Romans 13, uh, one verse, specifically verses 1 through 7 in its totality. If you have a Bible, if you have maybe your phone app, your Bible gateway app, if you want to look it up and read along, that's fine. I'm going to read both Romans 13, 1 through 7, and First Peter uh, 2, uh, the passage of First Peter 2 as well, in their entirety, just so you can understand what these passages are. Um, so you can understand, and we can consider these passages uh, specifically what they say. So Romans 13, 1 through 7 says, I've got the ESV translation, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. The rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword of vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So that's Romans 13, 1 through 7. And just reading that without 
any other immediate thought or uh, uh, any any other context, we as libertarians start to squirm in our seats a little bit. I think I know I've done it several times reading that passage, um, and 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 we'll talk about that in just a second. But I also want to read First Peter two. So the passage in First Peter two says, "Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good." Very similar language to Paul. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Again, not very libertarian almost immediately when we think about this. As libertarians, we're very skeptical of government, right? We believe in, uh, we, we accept libertarianism. We believe that libertarianism teaches that a uh, philosophy of, of political philosophy of non-aggression and that we shouldn't harm innocent non-violent people uh, and yet the premise of government is on the basis of like we talked about earlier the compulsory taxation the ability to force people to pay for or do things that they don't necessarily want to pay for or do uh, and that's and that's the very distinguishing characteristic one of the very distinguishing characteristics that makes government the way government is. And yet, here we have in Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2, seemingly a biblical teaching, a biblical doctrine that tells us that government is established for our good, to punish those who do evil, to praise those who do good, and that we are supposed to honor and pay taxes and serve the government with obedience. Uh, both of these passages seem to apply that, and I think it's a way a lot of Christians have interpreted these passages in the way that they try to understand the question, what does the Bible say about government? So how, as libertarians, do we deal with these passages? And how do we address the question, what does the Bible say about government? And most importantly, how do we retain integrity in our theological and faith commitments uh, in answering that question without trying to just make it, you know, make it so that we're fitting our Christianity into our libertarianism rather than fitting our libertarianism into our Christian worldview. So let's let's talk about context. Context is everything in the con in the context of, of interpreting scripture. Uh, I, I'm in the fitness industry now. That's that's what I do for a living. That's that's my my tent making, if you will. Uh, I that's that's where I make my money. So one of the things that you'll hear in gym culture among you know, people who are, who are lifters, especially weightlifters, they'll talk about if they're warming up for a very heavy exercise like a deadlift. Uh, it's one of the heaviest exercises you can do in, 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 the, in the gym. And they'll say, yeah, I'm just warming up with some light weight, just 270 pounds, you know, 280 pounds, nothing, nothing too heavy right now. I'm, I'm working my way up. And out, out of context, if you're just an average person, you're not in the gym culture, and you hear someone say that you're like 280 pounds, that sounds really heavy. I don't ever want to lift anything that's 280 pounds. But in gym culture, if you understand how strong people are and, and, and what people are able to deadlift, uh, especially you realize that there are a lot of people that can deadlift four, five, six, seven hundred pounds at their strongest, then you do understand how 275 pounds can be lightweight, even though out of context it sounds like it's very heavy. So let's apply that understanding of context in, in how we interpret these passages, both from a scriptural and a historical perspective. So first of all, I'm going to briefly address the historical perspective, but I'm going to spend most of my time in the scriptural perspective, because I believe that in interpreting scripture, scripture should help us interpret scripture so that we understand the context of all of scripture, not just one particular passage or, or, or verse. But let's talk about the historical context first of both. Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2. And then we'll talk more specifically about the scriptural context in which these verses and passages were written. So both Romans and 1 Peter were written as letters to uh, segments of the early church uh, that had a fair amount of Jewish influences, or at least were familiar with uh, uh, a lot of the Jewish politics of the day. Let's put it that way. Uh, for in Rome, there was a fairly decently sized Jewish contingent uh, in, in Rome, or at least people, again, who are familiar with the politics of Jewish zealotry, uh, which is why Paul writes so much about Israel in the book of Romans. Otherwise, just he's, he's very, he writes a lot about Israel and the Jewish nation um, in the book of Romans. 
Um, so, and, and first Peter was the same thing, writing both of these letters were written to segments of the church that had a large Jewish contingent or had a lot of Jewish sympathies. And the idea of zealotry, there was still a very rampant idea because there were many zealots and, and Jews who did not believe that the Messiah had come. They did not believe Christ was the Messiah. They thought that the Messiah was coming and that he was going to overthrow the unjust authority of the Roman government to reestablish the nation of Israel and to restore righteousness. And, and so Paul and Peter both had concerns that this, uh, these notions of, of Jewish zealotry maybe wouldn't become the dominating uh, feature of the church, but they might tempt those within the church to, to revolt or to um, make their faith something of this world as, as a means of challenging Roman authority. And it's very, very um, important to know this because— if Paul and Peter were writing in the midst of a specific historical context and a specific historical climate that made it such that they were essentially warning against turning their faith into what Christ said, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, if it was, my servants would fight. And I think Paul and Peter were both making sure that they wanted to get the message across that the Christ's kingdom is not of this world. It's not our job to fight. This the demise of the Roman authority is not the end of the Christian faith. It's the reunification of sinful uh, and undeserving humans with uh, with Christ. And so that is the historical backdrop in which Romans and First Peter are written. So we know that. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that at this point we can just say, "Oh well, uh, clearly what they said doesn't matter." Uh, so obviously. The Bible, please, says that government is inherently good. It is meant for our good. We should submit to it and obey to it, obey its commands. Uh, and, and that's the end of the story. But let's consider the scriptural context further. And I think this, this is where we really start to see that I think a lot of Christians take these passages out of context and use it to say something that the Bible and the original authors, Paul and Peter, uh, didn't intend to to say, and ultimately, of course, God, because the, um, the Bible, Peter and Paul were writing, writing under divine inspiration. So ultimately, my contention here, as we go through some of these scripture contexts, is that these passages were written in, in a historical context that were a reminder not to be politically disruptive and that that was not the focus of the Christian faith and that the focus of the Christian faith was on living out a Christ-like example. And therefore, they were not written as statements of political philosophy meant to legitimize or establish government as a institution uh, from a worldview perspective, but merely as, again, a contextual reminder. That being said, I'm going to respond to the idea that maybe that's not true later and consider that. But let's talk about the scriptural context of 1 Peter. And it's really fascinating because the scriptural context of 1 Peter 2 is very similar to the scriptural context of Romans 13. Uh, both of the passages of 1 Peter 2 and Romans 13 are surrounded by some of the most uh, stark and inspiring commands from both Paul and Peter to live out Christ-like examples of sacrifice and to show love to our neighbors and to uh, to be, um, to be, uh, to to follow the example of Christ in suffering and justice without complaining or without revolting. Uh, let's look at First Peter two real quick. Uh, if you if you if you again have your Bible or if you're if you're on Bible Gateway, First Peter two one through eleven. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let's let's look at a couple of of parts within that uh, those passages. Uh, first of all. Uh, if you look at 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. 
keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of visitation. Those are the verses that immediately precede um, the command uh, that we see or the, the exhortation to honor the emperor. It's interesting to me that Peter chose to talk so much about uh, having conduct that is honorable even among the Gentiles uh, to be, or remind them they're sojourners and exiles and uh, remind them that they're better than any nation that is earthly or any regime. They are a chosen people, a royal priesthood and a holy nation. That's the context and the backdrop for which Peter then goes on to say, obey the emperor. After Peter says, obey the emperor, the passage that I already read earlier, if you continue on and look at 1 Peter 18 through 20, uh, 2, 18 through 25, um, the very next few verses, we won't, again, I won't read the whole thing, but let's look at a couple. Uh, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. This is starting in verse 18. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if you, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you in an example so that you might follow in his steps. So both, so before Christ, or before Peter talks about obeying the emperor, and after Peter talks about obeying the emperor, he's talking about being honorable in your deeds, remembering that you're a holy nation set apart by God. And then immediately after, he's talking about how suffering for the sake of that which is good and the, the cause of Christ is, 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 a, is a good thing. Um, I think this really lends credence to the idea that, first of all, Peter's not writing about political philosophy at all. I think it would be terrible, a terrible misrepresentation of what Peter says in three, three or four verses uh, to say that is a statement of political philosophy. First of all, because that's it's very very hard to actually write good political philosophy in three sentences or three verses. Uh, secondly, because clearly in the context of the rest of First Peter two, there's a much bigger purpose that Peter has in mind, and then talking about what the role of government is and whether the emperor is 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 God's authority. Now, of course, it does when you go back to this specific passage itself and read it. It does seem to imply that there's things about the emperor that Peter says are good. Uh, but, uh, and this leads to both a question for both Peter and Paul. They both knew that the Roman government was evil, uh, and that they were, that it was filled with rulers who were tainted by original sin and who were, who were sinners just like everyone else. Uh, I would, I would not uh, doubt that Peter and Paul's moral compass was warped to the point that they just thought Nero or the emperor was good uh, just because they weren't an emperor. Uh, that's this. They they understood. Paul says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God in the book of Romans. The category of all includes all. In, uh, it includes uh, the, the lowly shepherd. It includes the priest. It includes the emperor himself. So they understood that the government of Rome was filled with sinful human beings. I think there's a little bit of strategy involved in, in that. So again, Peter, Peter was talking about not being above reproach. So if the Roman uh, government got a hand on this letter, there was nothing that they could do to stop it from spreading because it, it, it called for obedience to the emperor. So uh, I think there's a little bit of strategy there, too, in what Peter was writing, ultimately with the bigger message being be Christians, be Christians to those around you. And don't make this about political evolve. So that's enough about First Peter. Um, so the point at this point, I think, stands. First Peter is not a verse that establishes government legitimacy. If we read it in the historical and scriptural context that it is written in, don't just read the passage itself, First Peter 2, uh, 13 through 17, and just leave it at that. Um, let's talk about Romans now. Now, I, I know I mentioned this before. But Rome, the context for Romans is almost exactly the same as the context of First Peter. It's almost uncanny uh, how Romans thirteen is is so similar to First uh, Peter two, Romans twelve nine through twenty one. These are the verses that immediately precede Romans thirteen one through seven. 
Romans 12, 9 to 21. Again, not going to read the whole thing, but let's look at a, let's look at a couple verses. Verse 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. This is verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. That sounds a lot like what Peter said in in 1 Peter 2, just before he moved on to talk about uh, honoring the emperor. And Paul has just done the same thing here. And you can read the rest of the context there. Again, Romans 12, 9 through 21. The reason why I, I talk about Romans 12, 9 through 21 is because it, as a passage, is just about the Christian lifestyle, about loving people, about loving our neighbor. And, and, and ultimately, verse 21 itself, just the very first, the very last verse before Romans 13, 1, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I think that is very important to consider the context of then what Paul goes on to say in Romans 13, 1 through 7. And then, just like Peter, Paul sandwiches his exhortation to uh, political, uh, to obey political authority in Romans 13, 8 through 10, by saying, Oh, no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to your neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So just like Peter, Paul ends, it's not the last thought in, in, is not obey the emperor, obey the king. It is coming back to this idea of loving other people and, and, and coming back to, for Paul, what he says is the greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself in which all the other commands of not stealing, not committing adultery, not coveting are wrapped up here. Uh, again, what is Paul writing about here? If we're being intellectually honest and trying to assess what is the overall message of Romans 12 and 13? What's the overall message of 1 Peter 2 in the context of which they're writing? It seems to me that they're trying to explain how to be a Christian in the midst of an unjust society, an unjust government. They're, the purpose of writing Romans 13, 1 through 7, I don't think in Paul's mind, is to legitimize the institution of government. It's to remind Christians that in the context of everything else that he said, that they're, they're not to make political revolution their, their goal. It's not, it's not the focus of their faith. Uh, these other things from Romans 12, from Romans, the end of Romans 13, these are the things that they would be exhorted to. And in the midst of that, don't worry about the, the, the zealotry that was rampant among many of the Jewish influences at that time. Uh, it, it's very similar to, again, how if we understand context, if people were talking to us today about uh, political issues and how to be a Christian in the midst of uh, a political climate that's very divisive, there, there might be some things that they would hint at that we would understand. Uh, maybe regarding uh, things about race relations, because there's been a lot of issues with that, especially with with things like police brutality. Um, That might be something that we would understand if if a comment was made about that uh, to us in terms of the form of an exhortation, uh, because that we're specific. We understand that in that, in our time, place and circumstance, that's an issue that that comes up a lot. Um, So if somebody were to say, as Christians, how do we respond to, uh, government legitimacy and what's the role of government in this kind of situation um, and most importantly how are we to act as Christians in that in the situation of, of, of police brutality um, then we would understand what what's being said to us in in that context uh, in the same way Paul was writing in the midst of a context of and Peter of, of zealotry and and wanting to revolt against Roman rule and I think it's very important to understand that they did not want that to be the focus of the Christian faith. And consequently, both of them use very similar rhetoric in how they sandwich uh, their exhortation to obey political authority. All of that being said, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong and they actually did meant to legitimize political authority? And uh, those passages, Romans 13, 1 through 7, where it talks about... He is the, 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 the uh, does not bear the sword of vain, 
but instead he does not bear the sword of Bane and he is a punisher to those who do things that are wicked and a praiser to those who, who does good. There it is. And especially the commandment to be in subjection because you don't want to avoid God's wrath, for the, but also because for conscience, because it's the right thing to do. He does say these things in Romans 13, even though that the other previous contexts that I talk about are also true. If we are to interpret this passage is, first of all, again, outside of the context of what Paul was writing, and now we're just, we're just focusing on Romans 13, 1 through 7. If we're to take those commands as, as literal commands that, again, legitimize government that are meant to be statements of political philosophy uh, that are binding for all Christians outside of the context of the Roman Empire and, and the Roman Church, then we have some serious problems to wrestle with. Um, and one of the first problems that we have to wrestle with is that, again, it's hard to be very good at political philosophy when it's limited to a paragraph or to a couple lines. Um, so when Paul is saying all of these things, that there's a lot of questions that he leaves unanswered that any good political philosopher would answer very quickly. Uh, for example, uh, he does not at all address the idea of obeying an unjust government. He doesn't because he says, Whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad, which you have no fear of the one who is in authority, but do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. He is describing there a form of just authority. He's describing an authority that does punish evil and that does reward the good. He does not ever in this passage address the idea of what do we do if the authority is unjust? Uh, are we obligated to obey? He just says obey because the authority is good because it punishes the evil. Uh, he never addresses the question of if it doesn't punish the evil, then do we obey it? Uh, so it, it's a very, uh, it does not give us um, a very robust political philosophy in that sense uh, because it's, it's only a, applicable if the government is 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 just in its authority of punishing evil, uh, and also I think the implication is reading the context, we do not obey the authority if that authority commands us to do what is unjust and to hurt other innocent people, uh, and and this is why I believe as Christians we can justify the rebellion of a man like uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the Nazi regime. Uh, in, in trying to uh, rescue and help Jews who are being thrown into concentration camps and, and help to make sure, and ultimately, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was involved in the plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler himself. So um, I think the implication is, if, we're, if we are to look at it that way and say, well, if there is something here that we are, we should take as something that is political philosophy, anything Paul is just saying, obey a just government. Uh, but it, that's almost too obvious at that point to to even, you know, to say, uh, which, again, leads us to the question of why do you even say it? Um, but again, there may have been a strategic reason, because if Paul writes that, knowing the context in his audience and that they would understand what he was saying, but that the Roman authorities would see this and say, oh, well, this, this sounds good. This guy knows what he's talking about. He's fine. Then they would let this kind of letter continue to be uh, propagated or at least for people to be delivered to the people who are intended to read it. Um, so, and similar with 1 Peter 2, if we look at the, the text there, again, 1 Peter 2 says, be subject to the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor supreme or to governors is sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who good, do good. So Peter also only talks about obeying a just government, uh, not an unjust government. And again, this is very interesting because we all know both Paul and Peter both had very well-defined moral compasses. Uh, they understood ethics. They understood original sin. They understood that the Roman government had sinners and were full of sinners, just like any other area of society. So it's very interesting that either they would have just ignored that and given a blanket statement and said, doesn't matter. Original sin doesn't apply to government. Uh, it doesn't apply to the Roman Empire. They are obviously good and just, and everything that they do is God is is for uh, is for the good of society, and and it is it has God's backing behind it. Or I think the more likely 
Um, alternative or the more likely argument is that they were being strategic in what they were writing and ultimately what they were saying was meant to calm other calm Christians who would otherwise be prone to revolution. Uh, so even if we don't accept that interpretation, I don't think this tells us anything beyond obey a just government. Uh, and, and that may mean that, you know, that government is legitimized by the Bible. So you can't be like, for example, a, min- a minarchist and a libertarian and believe that a legitimate government would be uh, a, non- a non-aggressive government that has a very low tax rate uh, that only provides for basic services like defense. Um, and then this is established by Paul and Peter in, in Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2. If you go with my uh, interpretation uh, of, if you go with my interpretation of, of historical and scriptural context, and really saying, I don't think this is about political philosophy at all. Um, or at least it's not enough to ground us in a political philosophy of government legitimacy. Then there even is, I still think, room for um, even going beyond the monarchist position and potentially being a Christian anarcho capitalist, uh, which you, you know, don't have to be. Like, I, I think the, the point that I make in my book, too, is that I'm not trying to convince anyone of what libertarian position. They should hold based on what the Bible says, but I believe there's room for both the monarchist and the anarchist position within Christian libertarian circles. Hi, this is Carrie Baldwin of MereLiberty.com and a contributor here at the Libertarian Christian Institute. If you haven't heard, I'm debating Walter Block on the question of whether a woman has the right to evict or abort her fetus at any time during her pregnancy. This debate will be hosted by the Soho Forum at 3 p.m. on Sunday, December 8th at the Subculture Theater in New York City. Tickets for this event range from $12 to $24. Seating is limited and will likely sell out. Register now to reserve your seat. You can buy tickets at thesohoforum.org. To hear more about my position, you can visit my website at mereliberty.com slash abortion. Uh, a few other considerations, and then I want to move on to some other stuff because I want to cover a couple of other verses and still leave time for some questions here at the end. We also don't I, I don't I think it's incredulous to say that Paul and Peter were referring to the state as defined by Weber and Hoffa that I referred to earlier. Like they obviously understood that the state has the power to tax, and they talk about paying taxes, too many taxes you do. Um, but uh, I if a society were to arise, a working society were to arise, and it could be a small society, like it could start out as like a city or something, uh, that did not rely upon an institution with the power to tax that had a legal territorial monopoly, then would it be, if that such a society were to arise, and I don't think it's inconceivable that it could, would it be unbiblical for that society to exist? Um, and wouldn't there be other forms of authority within that society that we could argue are more just or more consistent with the ideas that Peter and Paul talk about with the idea of punishing evil and praising those who do good? And if that were to come about, wouldn't it be more, wouldn't it be better from a Christian perspective to advocate for a society that didn't have uh, a working society, that didn't have a state, if it were to arise, uh, than a society that, uh, that did have a state? And was and was uh, that caused more harm to the individuals uh, over which it, it, it presided. So that's another another issue. Just something to throw out. I don't really throw it out, other than to more as a thought experiment, uh, more so than than saying that it, it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, I also think we need to all, the one last consideration is that we need to understand Peter and Paul's understanding of God's sovereignty over governments. Both Peter and Paul understood that God is sovereign over the government. Uh, they did not uh, believe that governments existed or acted, uh, and on God was sitting up in heaven going, oh no, the Roman emperor did this today. Not, not sure how we're going to respond to that. Um, the, the Peter and Paul understood that God, God was sovereign over the Roman government, over all governments and that have ever existed, and that will ever exist. So uh, Peter and Paul understood that these government institutions, even though they were imperfect, were being used for God's purposes. We know this because Paul wrote in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good for those, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So that includes actions by sinful governments. 
Uh, and, and Paul and Peter understood also, of course, I mean, Paul, especially because of his scholarship of the Old Testament, he understood that government was an institution that God could use for his purposes, just like he used the Babylonian government to uh, uh, to punish the, the Jewish people and to take them into captivity for a time, uh, just like he used the kings of Israel for his purposes. Um, so there's there's a, they understood that as well. And I think that understanding is also very important to consider um, when thinking about, when thinking about uh, these passages. All right. So I hope that we have beaten these passages a little bit to death, but I think I think in a good way, uh, because they are very it's very important that if we understand these passages and if we understand them from a perspective that, again, is uh, understanding that scripture is authoritative that uh, our core doctrines aren't compromised, but ultimately these passages don't necessarily, in my, I don't think are good enough to say in and of themselves that they are counter to libertarianism or they refute the idea of libertarianism and therefore prove that Christians can't be libertarian when we consider the scripture and the historical context with which they were written and even specifically the potential political philosophical claims that are advanced therein. But let's talk a little bit about a couple other passages. Matthew 22, I'm just going to briefly talk about this. Matthew 22, 15 through 22. Again, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to it. And uh, if Doug, if you're able to look that up real quick and post that link, that'd be awesome. Um, so Matthew 22, 15 through 22 says, uh, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This passage is often referred to as the command that Christians have to pay our taxes because Jesus said to pay our taxes. I think this is even more ludicrous than the use of 1 Peter 2 or Romans 13 to legitimize political authority and demand that Christians obey political authority in all instances. And the reason for this is because it's very clearly in the context of the, of the story itself, very clearly shown that this is not a time when Christ is offering a teaching like when he was on the on the, the gave the sermon on the mount and he preached the beatitudes. There he was preaching to the multitudes. They came to listen to them, and he was telling them this: these are the these are this is the way that you should live. Essentially, here Christ is in uh, still amidst a crowd, but the Pharisees come up to him and they. It says clearly in the language of the verse and the passage itself, they wanted to entangle him in his words. They wanted to get this guy to say either one of two things. One, don't don't pay your taxes. And that would have flown really well with the Roman government. They could have immediately gone to the, the authorities, reported him, and then he would have uh, been arrested right then and there. Uh, so they wanted him to say that. Or what if he didn't say that? Then, then what if he said, oh, you have to pay your taxes uh, because the Roman government is, is, is the authority that is above us right now. Then they would have proven to all of the people that were hoping that he was the Messiah, that he wasn't actually the Messiah, because here he is talking about obeying and paying taxes to the Roman government. And how terrible is that? Um, so what did he actually say? Did he say pay our taxes? I don't think he did. If you read the passage again, he says, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. I think most Christians just look at the first half of that statement and they forget the second half when they talk about the idea of taxation or Christ's command to pay taxation. Yes, he said, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But let's think about that logically for a second. It's stated in contrast to and render to God the things that are God's. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. What can Caesar lay claim to? of us that God cannot lay claim to. There's nothing. So even if 
it can be interpreted that essentially I think it's very consistent with the interpretation of First Peter 2 and Romans 13. Pay taxes because we're not going to make this a revolt or we're not going to overthrow anyone. But my kingdom is not in this world. We're not going to fight. Again, very consistent with his statement there. But ultimately, what matters? What matters in this world? Is it what Caesar lays claim to or is it what God lays claim to? And as Christians, as, as followers of Christ, as followers of God, are we uh, more excited or, or does this passage mean more to us as a, as a call to pay our taxes or does it mean more as a, to us to remind, to remind us that God is greater and above all Caesars that have ever been and all political authorities that have ever been and he demands our obedience, reverence, and worship and ultimately our money, our conscience, our ethics, all of those things to him are where we we know in our heart of hearts are uh, are first and foremost a priority, not Caesar, not political authority, not the United States government, not the IRS. So uh, so I think in the context of this passage, the context explains itself. He was responding. He gave a brilliant response that didn't uh, fall into the trap that the Pharisees uh, wanted to him to fall into. He didn't come out and say, yep, pay your taxes because the Roman government is great and good. And uh, consequently, he didn't make all the zealots angry and, and prove that he wasn't the Messiah. Um, so to, to all those people, but uh, he also didn't. He also didn't come out and, and anger the Roman authorities because his time had not come. His, his ministry was not done, and and he gave a brilliant answer that allowed us to really, I think, think about what is God's and what is Caesar's, and ultimately God is above Caesar. <laughs> Again, I don't see this as an argument or a, a, a passage that legitimizes taxation or says it's good. In fact, if you read the rest of Scripture, the rest of the New Testament, you'll read that the tax collectors and prostitutes are often lumped together, uh, and that the idea of, of being a tax collector, and actually one of the, Matthew himself was a tax collector um, before, he, before he started following Christ. So the idea of, of tax collection is not really thought of well in, in, uh, in, uh, the, in the scriptural uh, context outside of this passage, or at least in the New Testament context. Um, so I think this ultimately, this passage is even easier to do from a libertarian perspective, um, but ultimately still from a theologically sound biblical perspective, uh, without um, without compromising uh, without compromising that. Really quickly, uh, and I know you know we want to make sure we leave plenty of time for questions, um, but I do want to refer uh, you all to several verses and. Um, if you have something to write with, that's fine. Uh, Doug, if you want to post these up, that's that's fine as well. Um, but um, and I, I won't read all of them, just a, a few. But Matthew 20, 25 to 26, I think is very interesting um, about the idea of authority. Uh, he says, uh, Christ says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles who lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. He's talking to his disciples here. Um, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, uh, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Uh, there's this contrast with the idea of essentially political rule. Uh, the great ones exercise authority over them with the idea of being a servant. And, and that's the example that Christ ultimately came to this world to show is that he was a servant. Uh, he could have he could have lorded over us from heaven. He could have. Just decide, you know what? None of these people are worth saving. Uh, I'm going to leave them all alone to die and go to hell. And that's that's perfectly fine with me. That's not the way Christ did it, though. Christ came to serve us, uh, even though we didn't even deserve it. Uh, and that is very much a stark contrast to the idea of political authority. The idea of political authority inherently is the idea that I, because I am endowed with some special power, I have the authority to say what other people can and should or shouldn't do, and they do not have the right to challenge that authority because it's made law. Now, of course, there's a lot of procedures and processes and things that we've evolved over time through many political systems, but ultimately it's one human or body of humans' ability to tell another human or another group of humans how they're supposed to live their lives. Uh, and there's a dominance that is associated with political authority that you just cannot escape from. Uh, and yet, this is very interesting. Christ tells his disciples, it shall not be so among you. If you want to be great, you need to be a servant. Um, 
So it's very interesting, I think, at least in terms of the ethos of political authority versus the ethos of what Christian servitude looks like. Uh, another really good passage, Psalm 146, 3, or at least a good verse. Put not your trust in princes and the son of man in whom there is no salvation. And by the way, I do see the questions popping up. Keep those coming. Uh, I'll be answering those here shortly um, at the at the end. But keep those questions coming. I do see them popping up. I want to make sure you guys know that I'm seeing that. But Psalm 146, 3, uh, put not tr- your trust in princes and the son of man in whom there is no salvation. Again, the idea that salvation or the plan of salvation is far more important than what's going on in politics or what the princes of this world have to say or what the rulers of this world do. Uh, it's very stark there in Psalm 146.3. Uh, and Ecclesiastes 4.1, I think, is, is a fantastic verse. And this is actually a verse that's at the beginning of my chapter in Call to Freedom. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. There's this... Um, theme, I think, in that verse where the, the author is Solomon, and, and he's, he's talking about, he's, he's going through all of his discourse, you know, he's again, keeping everything in context. He's talking about wisdom, he's talking about knowledge, and all the things that he's experienced and seen under the sun, and, and just the, the folly of humankind, and the folly of human endeavor, and one of the things that he sees that just drives him to despair is all the oppressions that are done in the world. Um, and and the tears of the oppressed, and there's no one there for them. There's, and, and the powerful are the ones who are abusing and, and, and crushing them, and he can't find anyone to comfort them. Uh, this is just one of the many sorrows that he has to deal with as a man who's very knowledgeable. Um, so where do we see this most in human history, this kind of example of abuse of authority? It's in political systems. Uh Every system of authority has abuse, and every system of authority in, in the world has, has led to some evidences or some manifestations of human sin in certain ways. But nothing has been more destructive of, of human beings and, and human dignity than political authority throughout history. Uh, if you need a very simple example as to why, consider the fact that about 250 million people were killed by their own governments just in the 20th century alone. Now, of course, they were totalitarian governments. They were they were the Soviet Union. They were the Nazi regime. But those are still political systems and political authorities. And they're also just continuing the trend of what happened centuries before, just not to as big a scale, because if you think about political authorities and monarchies and kingdoms, uh, throughout history and empires, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Egyptian Empire, uh, the Babylonian Empire, all of these empires and all these authorities were the business of, of conquest and killing uh, and, and have always been. So, yes. Uh, so if you think about other institutions and things that have done things that have been that have been harmful to people, say, like businesses or churches or, you know, where they haven't they haven't always done things the right way, um, those crimes are not at their door. Uh, whereas those crimes are at the door of, of political authorities. And I think Ecclesiastes 4.1 uh, really kind of helps us see that in perspective. Uh, and then the, the, I'm not going to read this one because it's too long, but read, if you haven't already, 1 Samuel 8, 10 through 17, as well as uh, Psalms 2, 2 through 4, because those passages uh, just, again, talk about almost how much the kingdoms or kings of the world are against God and how, or even how God is against many of those kings and kingdoms and, and about how they're, um, un, uh, and how they will do things and they are going to do things. And they do do things that are unrighteous that are against God and against his decrees. Uh, and it just goes to show again, the reality that governments are filled with sinful human beings, kings, presidents, Congress people, uh, IRS agents, Supreme Court justices, prime ministers, whichever form of political authority you want to take, they're full of sinful people and uh, they um, will take and do things in their own self-interest, their own sinful self-interest that ultimately end up harming people with the authority that they have. Um, so those are just, I, the reason I reference those passages is we also have to consider what these passages have to say. And then we also have to read Romans 13 in its own context, and we've got to also consider what these other, the scripture must, we, we need to use scripture to interpret, interpret scripture uh, if we're going to be consistent. So 
if if we see you know, Psalm one forty six three telling us to not put our trusted princes in the Son of Man, in whom there is no salvation, that should help us inform. Um, oh, uh, Jeff, it was um, it was Psalm two two through four. It starts off, "Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain?" Uh, but Psalm two two through four. Um, but it, it really helps us to, uh, um, I, I think, consider um, if we understand what these passages have to say about governments and the institution of government, then what do, uh, then we must also read Romans 13 in light of these passages as well, because they're part of the Bible too. So the first thing that Samuel 8 says something, and then Romans 13 says something, and they seem to be contradictory. We've got to deal with that. And I think the way that I deal with it actually helps us reconcile those contradictions, at least understand why Paul says what he says in Romans 13, but also why we read what, what is said in First Samuel, which is not flattering at all with regard to the idea of, of human political authority. Um, lastly, just to kind of wrap this up, because I do want to leave us with enough time for questions here. Um, first of all, if uh, we, I don't really want to talk about this right now, but if you all have not had a chance to definitely just a plug for the book. One of the things that I talk about in the book, that's not about what the Bible says about government. But I think it's still very helpful is um, again, if you read the book and you read the chapters at the end, I talk about St. Augustine. Uh, St. Augustine wrote again, not about political philosophy. He wasn't, he wasn't primarily a political philosopher, but he said a lot of things, a lot of things in, in the city of God, for instance, that really can help us understand political philosophy, I think, in a better sense, and actually develop a very healthy skepticism of the state. One of the things that he said, and some of you may be familiar with this, um, but the reason, the reason I'm mentioning St. Augustine is because even though it's not scripture, uh, he's still one of the most important thinkers of, of Christian theology, and uh, he was actually fairly adamantly against or at least very skeptical of human political authority. And I think it's very important to, to know that um, such a prominent thinker uh, was so skeptical. One of the things that he said uh, was that he told the story of a, a, a pirate who was captured by Alexander the Great. Uh, and, it, and he speaks approvingly of this pirate uh, because the pirate, Alexander the Great, he said, he writes the saying. um, what do you mean by the Alexander asked the pirate, what do you mean by taking cost of possession of the seas uh, and, 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 and causing fear in, in, in the people that you plundered? And then the pirate responds to Alexander Great. Augustine says it was an quote, apt and true reply that what I do, I do with a petty ship, but you do the same thing. You just do it with a fleet. And, and Augustine, I think has a very good understanding of, of, government as this this group of thieves writ large that essentially has the power to take from people what it wants uh, in order to make them do what it wants uh, to do and ultimately to do what it do what it wants to do so augustine likened alexander the great to the pirate that he captured just with a much much bigger uh, fleet of ships um so it's very important, I think, to, to look at a thinker like St. Augustine as well, even though, again, it's not, it's not the Bible. St. Augustine's the City of God is a very good book, but it's not, it's not the Bible. But it's still very important to see, like in the history of Christian theology, it's actually quite interesting to see that something that we would see, we would expect to see something like that in Frederick Bastiat. You know, in Frederick Bastiat's work, the law, we would see him say something like that. But 1,700 years before, however, I was 1,300 years, I don't know, the, the, the math my head is a little funky, but before over a thousand years before Bastia wrote the law, Saint Augustine uh, in the in the fifth century was writing about the idea of governments being uh, a giant robber fleet, or at least the emperor, the empire, the Greek emperor, uh, being the head of a giant fleet of pirates. So, um, lastly, uh, just to, to wrap up from the Saint Augustine point, I think there's a lot of implications for us as Christians and the way that we think about what the Bible says about government and the way that we live our lives and interact with people. So I think if we, if we think of the Bible as, as legitimizing government and constantly think of it as a command for us to obey and follow government and for us to hold it in reverence and, and not be as skeptical of it as I think we should be, as libertarianism tells us it should be, um, 
I think we're actually right. We run the risk of being in a very ethically problematic situation where how do we actually deal with the question? Like I said earlier, what happens when the government becomes unjust? Um, not saying that we don't necessarily know the answer to that. Uh, and one of the, I think the answer to that is honestly, as Christians, we need to ultimately remember our first and foremost priorities to love our neighbors with ourselves. But that may mean disobeying the government or doing something that is that is against what the government wants us to do in order to protect those who are innocent or to stand up for someone who's being abused and oppressed and to come to their aid. Um, and so that we're not like Solomon and Ecclesiastes, where we don't see someone who's coming to comfort the oppressed. And maybe we can be the comforter or we can be a part of being the comforter uh, to those who are oppressed. So I think there's implications for our ethics in the way that we even talk about political issues. Um, I, I definitely don't want to make it seem like uh, what, I, what I'm saying is that if you if you don't believe in libertarianism and you're a Christian, then you are an unloving, hateful person who just worships the state. Um, so some people may be, you know, some people may be that way, but I think it really helps us in just reminding what the Christian lifestyle is supposed to be. If we talk about government from a truly Christian perspective and not just that I'm an American conservative, proud of, uh, being in, being in America. And therefore I'm going to read Romans 13 and say, yay, America, which I think how, is how a lot of evangelical Christians actually read Romans 13, or at least why it's, it's thought of the way it's thought of today um and we actually focus on what we're supposed to do as christians i think we realize like first peter says we're a holy nation we're sojourners and exiles like paul like saint augustine says we're we're pilgrims living in this world and it's not the temporal regime the political authority all of that stuff it's it's not um it doesn't become the end all be all that i think a lot of people make it to be especially unfortunately a lot of christians um lastly I want to end on an upbeat note. And I know I've said lastly a couple of times, but this is definitely lastly. I would like to be at the forefront of a positive evolution in moral and political thought. Sometimes I don't think Christianity or Christians have done a good job with that. Uh, if you look at examples in the medieval era or even, in, uh, for example, pre-Civil War South, there were a lot of people who called themselves Christians who justified and did some pretty bad things uh, and, and argued that they were justified by scripture or justified by what scripture taught. Um, you think of like the Crusades in the Middle Ages, you think of slavery, um, chattel slavery in, in, in the South, and just often, and, and Christians were defending these practices. Now, on the flip side, there were many Christians that also stood against, for example, say the dawn of abolitionists who were Christians. I want to be more like those types of Christians and be, at the, again, the forefront of what I think could be a positive moral evolution and, for, and political for, political evolution where maybe it doesn't happen tomorrow. Maybe it doesn't happen next week. Maybe it doesn't happen next year. Maybe it doesn't happen in my lifetime. Maybe it doesn't even happen in my kid's lifetime. But maybe 500 years from now, maybe 1,000 years from now, there's going to be a society that actually does operate more along the libertarian ethic that, that is – very minimal in the scope of government and and maybe even that there might not even be a government who knows um yet and they might look back and laugh at the way that we did government the same way that we laugh at feudalistic societies now we laugh at at religious societies that had a divine king like the pharaohs um and i would like to be at the forefront of that that positive moral evolution and and even if it never happens uh even if even if uh, the state is here to stay, and it's large in scope, and it continues to grow in scope. Um, I think being on the, the right side of a positive moral evolution, whether it happens or not, is is the right place to be. And but it's not going to happen if we're not there, if we're not willing to stand up for it. But ultimately, uh, I'm going to stand up for it because I believe it's consistent with my Christian beliefs, not because I'm trying to fit my libertarianism into my Christianity. So. Those are my thoughts about what the Bible says about government. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. 
If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Hey, podcast listeners. Since you like listening to audio content, we wanted to let you know about a new audiobook titled Called to Freedom, Why You Can Be Christian and Libertarian. It's read by me, Jacqueline Isaacs, one of the contributing authors of the book, and every download helps to support the Libertarian Christian Institute. To learn more and to download the audiobook today, go to calltofreedombook.com.